first time in the auditorium room. Uh, we are taking questions at the center mic. We're not running mics due to the size of the room. So if you have questions, you can line up there and uh, I'll take them after, at the end of the talk. All right, and so take us away. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ron Pressler. I'm a programmer. And today I'm going to talk to you about TLA+. Uh, last year at Curion, I gave a talk about the essential theoretical difficulties in writing in very fine correct software, which was called Why Writing Correct Software is Hard and Why Math Alone Won't Help Us. Uh, today's talk may be called How Math and Thinking Can Help Us, or rather, How Math Can Help Us Think Better. Now, many of the languages and techniques and tools that we deal with in programming are basically designed to help us think less. Uh, so th there are things that we don't have to worry about. But at the end of the day, uh, the lion's share of the programmer's work is still thinking about the problem at hand. And this is something that TLA Plus can help with. Leslie Lamport, who created TLA Plus, wrote that for quite a while I've been disturbed by the emphasis on language in computer science. I believe that the best way to get better programs is to teach programmers how to think better. Thinking is not the ability to manipulate language. It's the ability to manipulate concepts. But how does one teach concepts without getting distracted by the language in which those concepts are expressed? My answer is to use the same language as every other branch of science and engineering, namely mathematics. So TLA Plus is a pragmatic mathematical language for specifying and verifying software systems. Specifying is just another word for describing. So you describe your software system or program in math, and uh, you describe your assumptions about it, and you can reason about whether or not your description of the program actually satisfies your assumptions. Now, every mathematical theory, even a relatively simple one like TLA plus is a broad subject. So today I'm only gonna cover the basics and show a few highlights, but everything I'm gonna talk about today and much, much more is covered in great detail in a Fort Park blog post, blog post series that I uh, posted up there. So if you find this interesting, everything is in there. One of the things that make TLA Plus so effective in practice is not just the language itself, but the tools that come with it. Uh, in particular, uh, there is a model checker called TLC that takes your description of the program and your assumptions about it and automatically verifies that your assumptions hold for your program. And uh, if you like uh, writing uh, formal proofs, there is a very nice proof language for TLA Plus and an interactive proof assistant called TLabs. But today I'm not going to talk about the proofs, about the tools at all, just about the language and its mathematical theory. TLA Plus was designed to be universal and scalable and still simple. So it's designed for any type of system of any size and any complexity. And it's made to be used by ordinary engineers, not formal method experts or logicians. It's a rich mathematical formalism with a very interesting theory and some very deep uh, theorems, but uh, its focus is on reasoning about actual engineered systems, not about math in general, and end-to-end -end verification, which is the ability to prove uh, high-level correctness properties all the way down to machine code, is not a focus of TLA+. Plus, It's possible it's not a focus, and that's a good trade-off to make because end-to-end -end verification is not feasible for the vast majority of software anyway, and also it's not a requirement. Uh, TLA Plus has been put to good use in industry. It's uh, being used at Amazon to uh, design and, and verify many of their AWS services. And this is, uh, in, a report, in a report Amazon wrote, uh, they say that an, even uh, an entry-level engineer can learn TLA Plus without any additional help or training in about two to three weeks and their experience with TLA Plus has been so positive that management at Amazon actually encourages development teams to use TLA Plus. There are a few uh, features distinguishing TLA Plus from other specification languages, uh, like Isabel or Koch. Uh, the first is that it is a simple mathematical logic rather than a programming language or a logic that is based on a programming language. Uh, this gives us very, very simple semantics. It's very easy to tell what uh, a TLA plus specification means. And because it's not, a it's not a functional language, it's not an imperative language, it's just math. 
it doesn't have a concept of a function or a subroutine. It doesn't have a concept of a process. It doesn't have a concept of a stack. It doesn't even have a concept of memory. We define whatever it is that we want to think about, and it helps us concentrate on the relevant details, and it alleviates something that uh, Lampert calls the Worfian syndrome, which is the confusion of language with reality. It also differs by uh, describing computations not as functions, but rather as dynamical systems, a little bit like how ordinary differential equations describe uh, continuous physical systems. And the benefit to that is that any kind of program, be it batch and sequential or interactive, concurrent, parallel, they're all described in TLA plus in exactly the same way. Their properties are described in exactly the same way, and the proof techniques for proving that those properties are correct are also the same. And it offers very rich and interesting uh, forms of composition and interesting notions of abstraction, and we'll see later on. Finally, TLA plus, uh, uh, the concept of non-determinism is very important in TLA+. And what this essentially means is that everything we say is just a description of our system at an arbitrary level of detail. And I want to spend a minute about that, uh, about the difference between a program and an algorithm. So a program is a description of an algorithm that is sufficiently detailed to be automatically compiled to an efficient executable. But an algorithm may lack that detail, let alone uh, a high-level description of a large software system. Let me give you an example. So this is the description of quicksort taken from Wikipedia. It has three stages. And the first stage says, pick an element called pivot from the array. But which element? And the reason it doesn't say which element is because it simply doesn't matter. No matter which element you pick, quicksort is going to work and sort. So even though this description of the algorithm is complete, you can deduce from this that it actually sorts and that it runs in worst case uh, quadratic time complexity, it cannot be efficiently compiled. Because if you, want to, if you want to write a program, you have to tell the computer which element to pick. You have to pick the first one, the last one, or a random one. But this says it doesn't matter. And later we'll see why being able to mathematically describe quicksort at this level is beneficial. OK, so let's get started with the theory. I said that uh, computation is a discrete dynamical system. So first, uh, a dynamical system is a function of time. A continuous system is one where time is a continuous variable. In a discrete system, time is a natural number. But a function of natural numbers is just a sequence. So we're talking about sequences. The kind of uh, uh, objects that, or how TLA plus describes computation is what Lampert calls a standard model. So a computation, which is a single execution of a program, is called a behavior. A behavior is an infinite sequence of states. It is always infinite. A state is a mapping from variables, which are just names, to values. So a variable can take different values at different states. And we define a terminating behavior to be a special case where, at some point, the state no longer changes and just repeats forever. We say that it stutters forever. Now, it's important for me to point out that when I say state, and perhaps this is a symptom of the Worfian syndrome, uh, I don't mean anything like a global or immutable state or anything that some programmers uh, say is bad, but it's anything in a program that can change over time. So uh, if you're thinking in uh, lambda calculus, it can be a beta reduction. That's a state change, or a recursive call, or uh, effects like IO. They're all just changes in state. And to drive this point home, so this is a pure functional program for computing the greatest common divisor. It has absolutely no imperative assignment in it, and yet the variables x and y point to different values, refer to different values at different states, at different depths of, of their recursion. OK, so state does not mean imperative assignment. So we have a behavior. That's a single computation. What's an algorithm? An algorithm is going to be a set of behaviors. Uh, why is an algorithm a set of behaviors rather than, ju than just one? Uh, because it can have many different executions. For example, a different execution for any input or any interaction with the user. Or if it's a concurrent algorithm, uh, then it has different uh, executions for different scheduling by the operating system. Or it can just be a high-level description of an algorithm, like quicksort before, that says you can pick any pivot, and 
different behaviors correspond to different choices of the pins. A property of anything can be thought of as a set too. So uh, the property of being red can be thought of as a set of all red things, and to ask whether something is red uh, is the same as asking whether it's a member of the red set. So we'll define a, a, a property of behaviors as a set of behaviors. But according to that logic, a property of an algorithm is a set of algorithms, so a set of set of behaviors. But that's uh, getting a little too complicated, so we're going to do, do a, a little trick. Our logic will only allow expressing properties of algorithm that are true of an algorithm if and only if they're true for every execution. So for example, quicksort actually sorts in every execution. It runs in worst case complexity, uh, quadratic time complexity in every execution. But we can talk, we cannot talk about uh, its average case complexity because that means that some behaviors can run faster or slower. Uh, so that's a property we can't express in this logic. And once we do that, we can also describe properties of algorithms as sets of behaviors. Why? Because then, to ask whether or not an algorithm has a property, we ask whether the set of behaviors of the algorithms is a subset of the property. Uh, so both of them are just sets of behaviors, and this is the only object we're ta we talk about. A TLA formula describes a set of behaviors. Now, what do I mean by describing something with logic? How do we uh, speak in logic. So a formula is an expression that is equal to some Boolean value, true or false, and depending on which assignments uh, of values it says uh, it becomes equal to true or false on, it can describe a set. So let me give you an example. So this is the formula with the single free variable x, and it says this. So x is a natural number, a member of the set of natural numbers, and x is greater or equal, uh, greater than or equal to two, and x is less than or equal to 10, and it is even. So the only assignments to x that make this formula true are these numbers, and we say that this formula specifies this set. TLA plus can be thought of as, uh, be, uh, as made of two parts. The, by far the more important one is TLA, the temporal logic of actions, and that's the logic uh, that describes the dynamic behavior of the program, what he talked about uh, the behaviors and how they relate to one another. And the plus part is uh, the part that describes the values that variables can take at each uh, state, so our data, and the, the operations on data that, that are going to take us from one uh, state to another. And in TLA+, uh, the data language, as I call it, is uh, based on set theory. The basic building block of a TLA+, specification, pretty much the only one, is a definition. A definition just gives an expression a name. It can be parameterized, uh, in which case we call it an operator. Operators can be higher order, so an operator can take another operator as a parameter. We can have infix operators. We can make uh, local definitions inside other expressions and uh, anonymous operators. Now, uh, it's important for me to point out that operators are not functions. Functions are something else, and for programmers, it's best to think of them as uh, macros. They pretty much do syntactic substitution. So the data language. We have the familiar uh, logical connectives. So this is negation, not. This is disjunction, A or B. This is conjunction, A and B. Implication, if A, then B. And equivalence, A, if and only if B. Then we have the uh, the uh, quantifiers, the first order quantifiers, there exists an x such that sub, some predicate holds, or for all x, some property holds. This is the name TLA plus for uh, Hilbert's epsilon operator. Uh, this expression takes some value that, that uh, satisfies the predicate p, if one exists, otherwise it's undefined. And we have some constructs that are similar to the ones from programming like if and else, so the value of this expression is A if the predicate P is true, otherwise it's B. Then we have sets, so the standard, uh, the standard modules that come with TLA plus define uh, the set of natural numbers, integers, and reals. Those are the mathematical sets, so they contain all the natural numbers, all the, uh, all the reals, and so if we want to work with, say, 32-bit integers, uh, we're going to have to define them, or 64-bit floats, it has a set of booleans, true and false, and string is the set of 
all character strings. We can define our own sets using set comprehension. Uh, so this says that this is a set of all natural numbers x such that they are even. So this is a set of all even natural numbers, and we can define the same set like this. So take the natural numbers and multiply them by two, and we have other familiar uh, set theory operations. Then we have functions. Functions are not how we de describe computations in TLA+. These are the usual mathematical functions. They don't even have to be computable. Any mathematical uh, function can be uh, defined. Uh, so this is the set of all functions from set A to set B. This is the square function on the integers. We can have uh, recursive definitions of functions. So this is a factorial function. And in terms of syntax, we apply a function with uh, square brackets to distinguish it from operators. We also have sequences or lists. They can be finite or infinite, uh, but they are just functions of some prefix of the natural numbers beginning with one. So they're one based. Uh, we have the set of all finite sequences with elements in the set S. Uh, we have special syntax for small sequences called uh, tuples. And we have uh, all the regular sequence operations. Finally, we have records like structs, and records are just functions from strings to values, but we have a nice syntax for them. So we basically have all the tools we need to define any data structure we want and any operation on data. So now we get to the uh, TLA part, the dynamic part. So a variable that can take a different value at each state is called a temporal variable, and we introduce one, uh, a free, uh, such a free temporal variable with a keyword variable or variables, and we also have uh, temporal quantifiers that are bold. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about them. And we're going to describe how TLA formulas look by building them up from expressions. And expressions in TLA have several levels, where an expression of a low level is just a degenerate case of all higher levels. So the, the simplest and lowest level of expressions are constant expressions that are the same in all states. The number three or these predicates here. A higher, the high, uh, one level up are state functions. State functions, as their name suggests, are, can take a different value at every state. And if x and y are temporal variables, then the expression x is a state function. So is the pair x, y, or x plus y. These last two, because they're state functions that are equal to a Boolean value, they're called state predicates. But since they're predicates, and they are equal to a Boolean value, they can serve as formulas. So the formula x equals 2, and we said that every formula specifies a set of behaviors. The formula x equals 2 specifies the set of all possible behaviors where the variable x is equal to 2 in the first state. So a state predicate uh, as a formula specifies the first state of the behavior. The next level is called a transition predicate or an action, and this is maybe the most important kind of uh, expressions in TLA and the ones that give uh, the temporal logic of actions its name. An action is a predicate on two states. One of them is primed, one of them is unprimed. We access the, the primed state with primed variables and the unprimed state with unprimed variables. We can also have primed expressions, and a prime expression is the same as priming all the temporal variables inside it, but it's best to think of it simply as the value of the expression in the primed state. So it just talks about two states and answers true or false whether there can be some relation on them. What relation? So these are all predicates. So as a formula, taken, so let's take a look at this one. Uh, uh, an action specifies the first two states or the relation between the first two states of the behavior where the unprimed state is the first one and the prime state is the second one. So this expression taken as a formula says that it specifies all possible behaviors where the value of x in the second state is one more than the value of x in the first state. The last level is that of temporal formulas, and this one is defined recursively. So if f is some formula, then so too is box f. And a behavior sigma satisfies box f if and only if every suffix of the behavior satisfies f. So the suffix sigma plus n is the behavior with the first n states removed. 
So it looks like this. This is uh, sigma plus zero, this is sigma plus one, sigma plus two, and so on. So now what happens if we put a box in front of a state predicate? So box P is true if P is true for every subface. But we said that uh, a state predicate specifies the first state of the behavior, and the first state of the suffix sigma plus n is sigma n. So box P says that P must hold for sigma zero, sigma one, and so on. So box P means that P is true, the state predicate P must be true at every state. If A is an action that works on two states, then box A is true if A is true for every suffix. But the first two states of the suffix sigma plus n are sigma n and sigma n plus one, and so A must be true for, sigma, for the first two states, the second and the third, and so on. So box A means that A is true for every pair of consecutive states. Now, because we can put box in front of any uh, temporal formula, we can put it in front of other formulas that have box in them. So if we take a look at this one and we follow the definition, I'm not gonna go over it with you, but it, it means this. Whenever x is equal to one, then from that point on, y must be greater than zero. So after everything we've seen, we can understand how to read the box operator, and it basically means always or henceforth from that point on. So we read this formula as always, if x is equal to one, then from that point on, or henceforth, y is greater than zero. Using the box operator, we define another operator called diamond, and diamond f is defined to be not box, not f. So let's think what that means. Not always not f, or not never f, or eventually f. So diamond f says that f, the, the formula f will be eventually true at some point in the future. We can combine them. So diamond box f is eventually always. Starting at some point in the future, f will always be true. And box diamond f says that at any point in time, f will eventually be true, which is the same as saying that f must happen infinitely often. So what does this formula mean? Uh, so it says that x must be equal to zero in the first state, and from that point on, the next value of x at every state is one plus its current value. So it specifies an algorithm that simply increments x at any state forever. And this is very similar to how we describe continuous systems with uh, ordinary differential equations, where we say that uh, the value of x at time zero is zero, and then the uh, derivative of x is always one, and to see how similar it is, and I'm lying here a little bit, but we can define this operator, this difference operator, and the formula up here is equivalent to this one. So it starts at zero and the derivative is always one. Okay, so uh, let's look at a more elaborate uh, specification. We're gonna describe an hour clock. An hour clock is a clock that displays just the hour. It has a single temporal variable, h, which is the hour, and h can start being any, uh, any natural number between one and 12. This syntax is just the set of all integers between one and 12, and at every step, it is incremented, or once it gets to 12, it wraps back, uh, back around to one. And we also define this that says that h is always a number between one and 12, an integer between one and 12. And then we can state a theorem about our program saying that if our behaviors satisfy the hour clock, then they satisfy the, this property that h is always within bounds. But here we run into a little problem, because suppose we now want to specify uh, a clock that shows both the hour and the minute. And intuitively, a clock that shows both the hour and the minute is also an hour clock. It also shows the hour. And we want to say that any behavior that is a clock is also an hour clock. Uh, unfortunately, this is not true because in the hour clock specification, h changes its value every state, and in this specification, h changes values only once every 60 states. So this is a problem we'd like to solve. So we introduce uh, a new concept called uh, a stutter-free form. A stutter-free form of some sequence of values is the same sequence with any finite amount of stuttering, any finite amount of repetition of the same value replaced with just a single instance. Uh, and if it's an infinite repetition, we, we leave it uh, at that. And we say that two sequences, sigma and tau, are stuttering equivalent 
if their uh, starter free forms are the same. So let me give you an example. All of these three sequences of numbers are uh, starter equivalent to one another, and the last one is starter free. Of course, the infinite repetition of four, we leave it at that. Now, this formula is not stuttering invariant. By that, I mean that it can distinguish between two behaviors that are stuttering equivalent. And by that, I mean that it can be true for one behavior and false for another, even if they are stuttering equivalent. So all these behaviors are stuttering equivalent, but this formula is true for the first, but not true for the other two because it says that x must increment at every step and that it doesn't happen here. On the other hand, this formula is uh, invariant under stuttering because it says that at every state, either x is incremented or stays the same. So I'm going to introduce the last uh, syntactic construct, uh, which is the square brackets. And the square brackets surround an action, and they have this subscript here with an expression that it is a state function. And an action inside square brackets is the same as saying either the action is true, so uh, the action takes place, or the value of this expression doesn't change. Usually this expression is just the name of a variable or a tuple of variables. And we introduce a syntactic rule that every time we have the box operator followed by a function, that function must be inside square brackets. And this syntactic rule says that every TLA formula is invariant under stuttering. If it's true for one behavior, it's true for all behaviors that are stuttering equivalent to it. If it's false for one, it's false for all the stuttering equivalent ones. And now if we have the proper, uh, this is legal TLA, the proper um, uh, specifications of hour clock and clock, and ignore uh, this line for a second, then uh, we get that indeed a clock is an instance of an hour clock. Uh, if you're wondering about this, because this action here is inside square brackets, it says that either h is incremented or it is allowed to stay the same. And it's allowed to stay the same forever. So the clock is basically allowed to stop. Um, so this additional condition says that the hour uh, must change forever and the clock must never stop. And, but in practice in TLA, we have uh, uh, an easier way, like built-in uh, built operators to define these, uh, we call them fairness conditions, and I'm going to ignore them for the rest of the talk. Now, this action is true for this transition, but it's also true for these other two. This action does not mention y. So the variable y can do whatever it wants. And th this is when I mentioned non-determinism. Basically, every TLA formula, all of them exist in the same universe, and they all specify the behavior of all infinity of variables, but they only de determine some of them. Any variable that we don't mention can do whatever it wants. But we can have more limited forms of non-determinism. So, for example, this action says that uh, in the current state, x is an integer, and so in the next state, x can g either be incremented or decremented. And uh, these two actions are equivalent to it. Uh, these are ways of expressing more controlled non-determinism. So in the next state, x is some value in the set, or there exists a k uh, in this set, such as x prime is equal to x plus k. The concept of abstraction is very important to programmers, but we're, because we're dealing with math and very uh, precise definitions, let's try to define it mathematically and precisely. So when we say abstraction, we mean that we care about some features and we want to disregard others as being irrelevant implementation details. So if we look at these sets of colored shapes, we can say that we only care about the shape, but the color is an irrelevant implementation detail. Or vice versa. We care about the color, but not about the shape. But this suggests that the concept of abstraction that we all like to talk about is simply a, a superset. So, uh, the abstraction and its opposite implementation. By the way, in TLA and in most formal methods, it has a nicer name. It's called refinement. So the abstraction refinement relation is nothing more than a subset or a superset. And we say that the set of behaviors F is a refinement or implementation of G, and that G is an abstraction of F if the set defined by F is a subset of the one defined by G. But in the syntax of TLA, this is just simple logical implication. If f implies g, then the set of the behaviors it specifies is a subset of those by g. 
And in fact, this relation in DLA plus uh, induces a partial order on all sets of behaviors or all formulas, depending of whether you want to think of it in terms of syntax or semantics. And uh, in fact, it's not just any, it's not just any uh, partial order, it's a lattice, uh, it's a Boolean lattice, if you know what that means. You can appreciate it, if not, it's not important. So now we get, uh, go back to uh, our discussion of quicksort. We can define quicksort precisely and mathematically now, expressing the non-determinism inherent in saying that we can pick any pivot. And then we can also specify a more detailed implementation of that, where we pick the pivot to be the first element. And then we show that this formula is just a refinement of that one. And what we get from that is that if we prove that quick sort, no matter how you choose a pivot, sorts, and we show that this program is indeed a refinement of quick sort, by the transitivity of, the transitivity of uh, implication, we automatically get that our program sorts. Now, Les Lampert said that when one thinks only in terms of language, linguistic differences obscure fundamental uh, similarities. And uh, in the same paper, he said that he gave this example. So these are three Java or C programs for computing that factorial function. And if you ask most programmers, uh, which of the three is most different from the other two, I think that most would probably say that the third one is most different because the first two are iterative or imperative, while the last one is recursive or functional. But these are descriptions of how the program is expressed, not of actually what it does. And in fact, uh, the first and third version do the exact same computation, and it is the second one that counts down that is different, and the only reason all three yield the same result is because the multiplication operation is commutative. If we were to replace it by subtraction, then the first and third version uh, would still give the same result, but the second would give a different one. So in TLA, we would write uh, the second version like this. Um, we have the parameter n, and we require, we can only move while i is greater than one because we're counting down, and as long as i is greater than one, we multiply f, subtract i, and once i is no longer greater than one, then this becomes false, and we just stutter forever because of the uh, square brackets. Uh, it's better though, instead of having n as a parameter, to use non-determinism and say that in the first state, add n as a temporal variable, and uh, say that in the first state it can be any natural number, uh, and say that it doesn't change uh, in, during the steps, and the keyword on change is just syntax sugar for saying n prime is equal to n. And this would be factorial one and factorial three. But now you're gonna say, but who said that the fact that the third version uses recursion is not an important detail? Why are you telling me that recursion is an unimportant uh, implementation detail? Uh, I could care very much about, say, memory consumption, and it differs uh, by a lot from the other two versions because of memory consumption. But TLA plus lets us specify at any level we want. So if we want, we can define mathematically, never mind the details, we can define mathematically what a stack is and what it means for a function to recurse and to return, and then we, uh, we specify factorial three using recursion. But even if we do that and we specify factorial three at this level, still this is true. Factorial three implies factorial one because factorial three is a more detailed description of factorial one. It's, uh, it's a, a refinement of factorial one, but not of fact two. So this kind of abstraction uh, helps give us insight into how and why something like fact three works. Uh, sometimes we're interested in weaker forms of equivalence and we can say, but we don't even care about that. We only care when two functions given the same inputs give us the same outputs. This is called uh, extensional equivalence, and for all we care, all the factorial functions are the same. And it's very easy to define uh, extens an extensional equivalence operator in TLA+, uh, just a couple of lines, but instead I want to show you that even, th even this is just a point on this lattice of uh, abstraction. So, if we care only about the input and the output, we can describe 
another, or specify another factorial algorithm that only cares about the first state and the last state. And this one is going to do a little trick. It's going to simply use the factorial function to compute factori the factorial in one step. So in the first, uh, in the first state, f is going to be equal to zero. It can be, uh, it's completely arbitrary, but I chose zero. And then immediately, it's going to calculate the factorial. So this specification only cares about the first, step, uh, the first state and the last state. Uh, it, it, it exemplifies the meaning of what it means uh, to be extensionally equivalent. We only care about inputs and outputs. And I put it inside something called a module. If you're familiar with ML, it's uh, kind of like ML modules. Uh, if you're familiar with object-oriented uh, languages, you can think of it as a class. And then inside the definition of fact one, we define this value done to be equal to true when we finish computing. We're counting up. So uh, we're done once we've, uh, we've gone over n. And then we instantiate, it's like creating an object. We instantiate, instantiate this fact out, this extensional module, and we map to uh, f in the, in the extensional module this expression. If we're done, we map f. If not, we leave it at zero. And this is called a refinement mapping. So this mapping works on entire behaviors. So this is a behavior of fact one, and this is what happens to it under the refinement mapping. And you'll see that at every state, what we map stays the same. F is still zero until the last one. It gets cut off there. The last one, F is 24. It's done. And uh, this one uh, uh, maps the actual, the actual result. But here, we're just stuttering. The first three steps, the first th three states are the same. And therefore, it's equivalent to this stutter-free behavior where the computation is done in a single step. And so it is true that fact one is just an implementation of the extensional factorial under this refinement mapping. So we've shown exactly what it means to be extensionally equivalent. And similarly, for fact two, we do the same. It actually takes one more step, but it doesn't matter because the mapping only passes the result of f at the end, and it's still only equivalent. Uh, only, uh, it's still equivalent. Uh, it, it's a refinement of fact alg. Uh, so both versions, the one that counts up and the one that counts down, uh, are refinements of this description that only cares about the input and the output. So the last thing I'm going to talk about, I have one more slide, um, composition. So when we write programs, we compose things. And we have many different kinds of composition. Uh, we can have a functional composition. For example, function A calls function B. Or we can have service composition. One service sends messages to another. But a system that is made of several components must satisfy all of them. A component is just a specification of a small part of the system. And so in TLA+, it's, it's obvious that if we must satisfy many components, it's just a conjunction. It's just an and. And uh, of course, depending on different kinds of composition, uh, we might need to uh, have a different, uh, a different operator here. Uh, and maybe another subformula that says how the two are combined. So let me show you an example, and I'll end with this. So this is called Plotkin's parallel or. Plotkin's parallel or is the following problem. Describe a program that is given two programs as inputs. And your program must terminate if and only if one of the input programs terminates. Usually, uh, and, and the solution to that is simple. We just simulate both programs one step at a time, and we alternate from one to the other, and we terminate as soon as one of them terminates. So usually in languages that describe computations as functions, being able to simulate programs requires having access to their source code. But in TLA, because we describe programs as dynamical systems, we don't need that, uh, and we can still treat them as opaque formulas. So this is parallel or. We, ha we take two, uh, uh, two specifications, two programs. There are just temporal formulas as parameters, uh, spec 0 and spec 1. State 0 and state 1 are a tuple of the temporal variables that those functions uh, care about. And uh, if you jump here to the end, you'll see that the composition is just spec 0 and spec 1 and something that's going to say how we compose them. So how do we compose them? We introduce a new temporal variable with uh, the existential temporal quantifier, it's a bold case. 
and called p. And p starts at 0. And then p alternates between 0 and 1. And whenever p is 0, we only allow spec 0 to take a step. And whenever p is 1, we only allow spec 1 to make a step. How do we do that? So when p is 0, we require that state 0 change and that state 1 must not change, and vice versa for 1. And so we move from one to the other. We allow one to take a step in the other. Uh, and then when, say, spec one terminates, and the next time p is equal to zero, we tell spec one, okay, now you must take a step. State zero must change. But we said that a terminating behavior is one when the state no longer changes. So spec zero can no longer take another step. So this entire action becomes false. And we ourselves can no longer take another step. The only option we have is to stutter forever and basically terminate. So I hope uh, you've learned a little bit about how we can describe programs and their properties in maps and how maps can help us find insight into abstraction and composition and uh, everything else. And like I said, you can find uh, everything in a lot more uh, on my blog here. Thank you. OK, we can take some questions. Uh, Senator Mike. Yep. Uh, could you give us a real-world example of the property that can be proven uh, by the usage of TLA plus? Sure. For example, uh, a consistency of a database, uh, se sequential consistency of a database, a linearizability of a database. Mm -hmm. You have a distributed database, and you want to show that it's linearizable. Or you want to show that uh, you have distributed transactions that, um, uh, that are really transactional. Or you can have, say, a, a a concurrent algorithm that you want to show that is, uh, is free of data races. Or you can show that a sorting algorithm actually sorts. So pretty much anything. In fact, yeah, th there is a completeness theorem for TLA+, plus, but uh, pretty much any property you can think of. Thanks for the great talk. Um, so there is this very, very famous dualism between uh, specification systems and their implementation. So there is this notion that sufficiently detailed specification is equivalent to, or like uh, developing a sufficiently detailed specification is equivalent in its effort to develop, like, developing that system and your in like programming language of your choice. So it's, it's obviously very, very useful to have, for example, certain properties of your database being described in TLA and reasoned about but when we want to make this jump into the actual database implementation, then um, how TLA plus helps us in that? Because the complexity of the resulting database in the real programming language remains the same, and it's so error prone as before. Right. So first of all, I'm going to say that in the whole formal methods, the, perhaps the most charged word is can. Um, a lot of things in formal methods is possible in principle, but not so feasible in practice. Uh, in principle, you could write your program in whatever in Java and uh, translate it to TLA plus, and then show that it refines your high-level specification. It's not just in theory; it's actually been done, but only for small programs. And you write the the fact is that no matter no large program or even me medium-sized program, has ever been proven entirely correct. So the only programs, it doesn't matter what tool, the, the only programs we've been able to completely verify deep properties, I'm not saying a null pointer exception, I'm talking about true correctness properties, uh, are pretty small. I think the biggest one is about 10,000 lines of, of C code, uh, perhaps a little bigger. So the way TLA plus solves it is by saying, if you have a very large system, you're going to only specify it at a pretty high level that's where the design bugs are. And then the translation you're going to do manually and use other tools that reason at the code levels, at the code level. And it works very nice in practice, uh, as you can see from Amazon and even Oracle, it's being used. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, my question is, uh, it seems that uh, on the contrary, like from the system like Coq, or Agda, uh, the TLI plus allows uh, functions to not be total. 
No. No. So these are mathematical functions. There is no such thing as a non-total function. That's a in, invention of, of constructive functions and programming language. There is no such thing as a non-total function. So it's just completely total. The the algorithm may not terminate, but that's yeah. completely legal. There's nothing wrong with a non-terminating comp uh, computation. Yeah. But Many but, comp okay, but you can uh, prove totality in TLA plus of some algorithm. It, is it possible, or it's like it's not uh, you, totality of an algorithm or a function. Or a fun of, uh, like I have a s an, uh, I have a piece of code like function. an algorithm. An algorithm. Yeah. Okay. Of course. Uh, so you can prove totality just like you can prove anything else. So in theory, it can be done. In practice, you of course uh, there, there's no because of the halting theorem, there is no completeness here. You can't prove for every algorithm that it's total, but for some algorithms, you might you may be able to prove that they terminate. And termination is actually not a very interesting uh, property. Uh, termination only applies to sequential programs. In TLA plus, you often reason about more interesting liveness properties. For example, that your server, for every request you get, always gives you a response. Or that a concurrent algorithm never locks for uh, forever. And these are things that, if you think hard, long and hard enough, then you may be able to prove. But of course, not in the general case. There, there's no magic here. Thanks. Do the Thanks. last question. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, side note: Comsat is actually pretty big, a uh, big size uh, C compiler that has been proven to be correct. So let me. Uh, but an I don't average, get an average. Let me just say, an average, an average uh, software piece of software in industry is about five million lines of code, and that's the medium size program. Comsat doesn't even get to a hundred thousand, I think. Lines of it's not it's okay. not comparable okay. to that. But it's it's reasonably sized. Anyway, uh, my question is how much work is it to prove something in practice? Let's say I, I write quicksort, and let's say I want to prove it's correct. How much work do I have to do? So, uh, after a lot of experience with uh, the m most benefit comes from just using the the model checker. You press a button, and it tells you it finds a uh, it finds a, um, counter examples. If you want to prove using the proof language, which is very nice, and it's basically a front end to Isabel. Uh, if you want to prove something uh, using for, uh, formal proofs, that's a lot of work. And in industry scenarios where TLA plus is used, it is almost never worthwhile because, again, we're talking about systems with tens of millions of lines of code. And proving them would take forever. Uh, if you want to just prove the correctness of quick sort, it's about as hard as proving it in Cocker and Isabel. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, now it's time for lunch. We'll see you back here for the keynote at 2.